right, everybody, let's open up to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. If you guys are taking notes, you can go ahead and do so in the weekly updates that you received when you came in. Or if you like, you can go ahead and go to the Version Bible app. On the event section, you'll find our list in Northeast Christian Church. And right now, we are live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. So if you, if you have your phones, do me a quick favor. Hit the share button on this video. It's an easy way to share the love of God with somebody who might need it here this morning. Um, you guys ready to have a little bit of fun today? Good, good. I like that. I like that. I like the enthusiasm. Woo! All right. I, I love being dad. I really do. I'll be honest with you. It has its moments, okay? But overall, I love being dad, or as my boys refer to me as papa, all right? I love, I love being papa, all right? Um, and this last, this last week, specifically Monday, Labor Day, we, we, most, a lot of us had it off and everything like that, I, I, I couldn't have been more proud. I couldn't have been more proud. Um, starts off, first and foremost, uh, Jonas, uh, he did his first ever devotion, okay? His first ever devotion, family devotion. He led devotions for us. And it was all, on Labor Day. It's about rest. He did such a fantastic job. It was so well written. I, I, I was so proud. I was so proud. Later on, he came to me. He said, Dad, do you have any suggestions of how I could have done better? And I was like, I got a few notes. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, he did fantastic. He did a great job. I was so proud of him. I love being his, his, his dad, his papa. Um, later that day, Tobias um, created a very convincing PowerPoint presentation about why we should allow him to buy a lacrosse goal for the backyard. <laughs> I know. He, uh, that's the only thing he learned from the sermon last week. That right there. All right. Um, but... I'll be honest with you, I was, I was dead set against it. Like when he was like, I want a lacrosse goal for the backyard. I was like, no, nah, it ain't happened. But then I watched his PowerPoint presentation. And I was like, I'm convinced. Let's get it. Okay. Um, his punctuation was horrible, but that's okay. All right, we'll let it slide. Earlier in that day, my, my, my Finn, my little Finn, my, almost, three mo- almost three months now, right? Going close. And uh, Finn, uh, me, Faye, and Finn went to Sam's and as a... As, uh, Faye was getting Finn all ready, and we were getting ready to walk into Sam's. I noticed that Finn uh, threw up down the back of Faye's shirt. I was so proud of him. <laughs> Just so you know, you guys, oh my gosh, Justin, that's horrible. No, I told her, I said, hey, Faye, Finn threw up down your back, and she was like, whatever. And she just kept, well, we shopped. She shopped like that. And so mom life, that's, that's what it is. And so um, I, I couldn't have been more proud. Um, on Monday... On Monday, if God would have come up to me and said, Justin, listen up. You see the stars in the sky? That's how many kids you're going to have. On Monday, I would have been like, cool. But he didn't say that to me. He was like, Justin, three's enough. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> he didn't say that to me. He didn't say it to you. He said it to somebody else. He, he said it to a man named Abraham. He took him outside Genesis. 15, 5. He took him outside and said, look up into the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said, so shall your offspring be. Later on, Genesis 17, he repeats the promise. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. Let's just think about this for a second, right? Let's just think about this for a second. That's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids. You know what that means, right? That also means it's a big, that's, a, that's a big mess. That's a big mess. Lo- that many kids, that's a lot of diapers. It's a lot of Cheerios and the cushions. It's a lot of Legos to step on. That's a, that's a lot of kids. Don't even bother cleaning, okay? That's just, that's just a lot of kids. All right, think about that for a second. That's a, that thing, imagine that grocery bill, all right? That's a lot of Hot Pockets and Tostino's pizzas, right? It is. That's a lot. That's a lot. Like, you're literally going, hey, it's an entire cow. That's what it is. What's for dinner? A cow. Walmart doesn't deliver just a cow, okay? They're like, no, we can't do it. It's too much. Uh, let's think about that. That's a lot of fights to break up, isn't it? All right, kids are going to fight. Kids are going to fight. When you have many, when you're the father of many nations, that's not a fight. That's a riot. Luden's going to be happening, all right? You're going to be there trying to break up a fight between Barry, keep Barry from choking out Umberto, and then you're going to look over, and there's Marvin walking by with a 52-inch screen, flat screen. You know, you're like, did you just loot that? You're grounded. That's a lot of names. It's a lot of names. You can't all name the same thing. You can't name 60 kids Terry, all right? 
All of them are going to look back at you like, me? I don't know. I can't even keep, you two, keep them all set apart. You got to come up. You got to be creative with names. You got to come up with different names. And then you got to keep them all straight. I can't keep three straight. I call, I call Toby Finn. I call Jonas Toby. I call Finn the dog's name. That's what I do. I can't keep three straight. It's a lot. It's a lot going on there. It's a lot of kids. It's overwhelming. I know it's overwhelming for me. You know it's overwhelming for you. Let's imagine that it's overwhelming for Abraham to hear this as well, especially given the circumstances he and his wife were experiencing, and especially at the timing of this message. Today, today we're going to look at the covenant that God made with Abraham, and then we're going to look at how he fulfilled it completely. But first, but first, there's this side point. I can't get past this. I was writing this on, on Tuesday, and I couldn't get past this. Genesis 11. This is the first time we see Abraham. He, he's not Abraham there. He's Abram. His name is changed later. I'm going to refer to him as Abraham for the rest of the time, unless, all right, it's in Scripture, okay? So the first time, before any promises are made to Abraham, before any promises are made to him, Genesis 11, all right? Genesis 11. He was just called Abraham at the time, okay? But he, along with his family, I want you to understand this, were not worshiping and serving God. In Genesis 11, Genesis 12 is his calling. Genesis 11, he is not worshiping, he is not serving God. This is confirmed in Joshua 24, 2 through 3. He says, Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other God, but I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him through the Canaan and gave him many descendants. Remember that this is post-flood. The flood, we know, does not eradicate sin. Sin is still very present. Sin is still very active, okay? But, but people then, they did not just, not everybody worshiped God. Abraham and his family did not worship God. They worshiped other gods. So then him, he and his their family would have been considered idolaters. For those of you that think and sometimes say out loud that God can't use me, I want that phrase deleted from your vocabulary. I don't ever want to hear that again. I don't ever want to hear that phrase again because there's nothing that God can't do and there's no one that God can't use. Abraham is the first example. Because God didn't choose Abraham because he was a really good guy. God didn't choose Abraham because he was already worshiping God. He didn't choose Abraham because of any trace of faith. He just chose him. He just chose Abraham despite being an idolater. God calls him out. In Genesis 12, 1 through 2 says, Go from your country, your people. This is what God says to Abraham. Your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. So right here, Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, leave your country, leave your family, leave it all behind, and he makes three promises. The three promises are land, offspring, and blessing. Three, all of these are very important in and of themselves. In and of themselves, they're very, very important, very distinct too, but they're all interrelated, meaning, meaning that one, uh, one fulfillment of one aspect contributes to the others. But of all of them, the offspring one is the foundation for all of them. What good is the land if you don't have the offspring, right? What good is the land? What good is the blessing if you don't have the offspring as well? And so the, the offspring are the foundation of what the land and the blessings are, are built upon. All, right? all of them are pretty big promises. All right? Made to a fellow that isn't following God. Despite that, God chooses Abraham. Out of everybody else on this earth at the time, he chooses Abraham to further his kingdom, meaning that God can use anyone. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down here this morning. This is a very important point. God can use anyone. He can use anyone, and he does use anyone. God, there's nothing that God can't do, and there's no one that God can't use. There's no one that God can't use. Instead of saying, no, God can't use me. I don't want you to say that. I want you to be like Abraham in verse 4. What does he, what does he do? It says, Abraham went. He obeys, just as God told him. He obeys. He goes, and he does exactly what God told him to do. He trusted him. Pretty, pretty big side point, but whatever, okay? <laughs> now, let's get into this covenant. Let's look closer to the covenant and, and why this is so significant, all right? First time, all right, we go back to Genesis 11. Before Abraham is called, verse 30 talks about his wife. 
All right. Here it says Sarai, but her name is Sarah. It's changed later on. I'm going to refer to her as Sarah, other, with, other than less I'm talking in Scripture. All right. But verse 11, Genesis 11 says, Now Sarai was childless, all right, because she was not able to conceive. Abraham's wife is barren. She just couldn't have babies. And this hurt. She, this hurt her. She was, she was very upset about this. This was not, she felt, she felt a lot of shame because of this. And, and this is the thing. Knowing that and hearing this promise probably makes it more difficult because all of the odds are stacked against her and Abraham. She can't have babies. And so it probably hurts even more to hear a promise like this. In addition, not only can Sarah not have kids, her and Abraham are very, very old. That's the reality. They're very, very old, all right? At the time of his calling, Genesis 12, Abraham is 75 years old and makes Sarah about 65 years old, all right? God reiterates, all right, in Genesis 17, he reiterates the promise. We're going to look at it here in a second a little bit more. He reiterates the promise to Abraham, and we learn that at this point, this is 25 years later. He's 100 years old. Sarah is now 90 years old. And he hears his promise, and Abraham just starts laughing, all right? Verse 17, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? Two very great questions. Now, here's the thing. Having a kid at an old age, all right, is an impossible. Yours truly is the example, all right? It's not impossible, all right? Matter of fact, nowadays it's happening more and more. We see, we see it happen uh, pretty regularly nowadays. But not as old as Abraham and Sarah. No. Nah. Nah. Now, we don't see that, all right? We don't see something like that. Now, it, it's, it's feasible. It, it, it could possibly happen. But given the circumstances that not only is Sarah very old and Abraham is very old, but Sarah is barren, that's what sets up for this impossible feat. That's what sets up for the absolute impossible. So how, the reality is, is how are you going to have one, let alone the stars in the sky? How is that going to work? And you got all the odds stacked against you. And despite that, despite that, God confirms, reiterates his promise over and over and over again. Genesis 12 is the very beginning. He says it the very first time. Genesis 12, he, he calls Abraham and makes his first explicit promise, all right? Then Genesis uh, 15, God reasserts the covenant. He reasserts his covenant, and he, and he gives more detail. It's in a more formal manner, and he makes it official. He makes this covenant with Abraham official in Genesis 15. Then you get to Genesis 17, and he reasserts it once again. He establishes this the sign, the sign being circumcision. But he reestablishes it. He repeats it over and over and over again, despite, despite the odds being stacked against them. And I think that's absolutely amazing. We look around and we're like, yeah, it's probably not going to happen. And we think, no, probably give up hope. But God says something, and then he repeats it over and over again. God doesn't back down. He keeps pushing he keeps telling them over and over again that it's going to happen. And then what happens? It does happen. We look at Genesis 21, 1 through 2. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. And Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised. Last week, we made a very important point about God and promises. We said that God always keeps his promise. If you're taking notes, let's write that down again today. This is foundationally for us to understand covenants and, and the agreements that God enters into us, that when he makes a covenant, when he makes a promise, God is always going to fill it. He's always going to fulfill it, all right? She's barren. They're old. God says, you're going to have a baby. They're like, no way, and then it happens because God is a God of his word. God is a God of answered promises, Abraham and Sarah are overjoyed. Look at her response in, in verses 6 through 7. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Then she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have bore him a son in his old age. Look closely at, at, at that little phrase right there. Who would have said? Kind of like saying, who would have thought? The answer is, not us. 
I wouldn't have. You wouldn't have. None of us would have thought this, right? None of us would have said this either. Only one said it. Who said it? God said it. God says it. And as we learned last week, God is the God of his word. When he says something, it stands true. No matter how long ago he said it, for a thousand generations, what he says stands forever. And when he makes a promise like this, he's going to stand by his promise. He fulfills it. He makes a promise. He keeps a promise. Abraham and Sarah, although the odds are stacked against them, their God stands true, and they have a son. Beautiful story, right? Beautiful. But here's the thing. The promise was more than one, wasn't it? It was more than one. A lot more. All right? One's good. One's good. And one's a miracle. There's a lot more than one. The promise made to Abraham and Sarah was, was not just one son. The covenant that was established with them was for many nations. And then understand, understand, it wasn't just Abraham, it was Sarah too. Abraham had eight kids all together on his own. Sarah and Abraham, one. Only one. But the reality is this, it wasn't just about Abraham. It was about Abraham and Sarah. So how does God fulfill the larger part? You know, the father of many nations part. You know, the stars in the sky part. You know, there's actually this other part where it says your, your, your offspring, all right, will be uh, the number of the sands on the seashore. It's a lot of sand. It's a lot of kids. How do we go from one to that? How do we go to many? Going to need a lot more. Genesis, Galatians 3.16. The Apostle Paul writes, he makes a pretty... Um, I think it's a significant, extremely significant observation, all right? The Apostle Paul writes, The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Like I said, it's a pretty interesting observation pretty interesting observation that translates that it's not plural in Genesis 15 5, all right? We look back at Genesis 15 5, it says, look at the stars in the sky, count the stars, if indeed you can count them, then he said, so shall your offspring be. So he says one. Paul recognizes, Paul recognizes, and, and that one is not referring to his son Isaac, it's not referring to him. That one is actually referring the culmination of the promise that he made to Abraham. He says that is in reference to the death, and burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says that one right there, that is Jesus. And so in that moment, back then, when, when God and Abraham are there, and God is making this, this promise to Abraham, understand this, Jesus was always the answer. Jesus was always the promise. All right? He was always the answer from the very beginning. He was always the answer to this promise. He was always the fulfillment of that promise. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise. He is the ultimate fulfillment. While, while Abraham had many physical descendants because of his son Isaac, he did have a lot of them, um, Jesus establishes a much bigger family. A family that's that's based in faith. A family that is right here, right now, today in this building. You and I are the result of God's answered promise. We are the many nations. We are the stars in the sky. We are the sand on the seashore. Jesus is the answer. We're the result of that promise. And that's how God answers Abraham's promise. It's us. We jump down to Galatians 3, 26 through 28. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither nor male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of Abraham's promise 
to the covenant of Abraham, all of us who belong to Jesus in faith, we are that seed. Listen to what it says. The last verse, it says in Galatians 3, 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to that promise. So Jesus is the answer to that promise and every single one of us here today, we are all the result. Will you pray with me now? Lord, I love you. I give thanks to you for all that you've done for all that you've given us. We praise you that you are a God that stands true. You are not like us. You, you, are, you are God. You are not like any one of us. When you say something, it stands true for a thousand generations, and I thank you for that. I praise you for that. The promise that you made with Abraham is fulfilled through your son, Jesus Christ, here today. I give thanks to you that I and all of us here today can, can stand firm knowing that we are the many nations, that we are the stars in the sky, that we are the culmination of your words 